Tonight on the News Hour, we begin a four part series on the Great Bear Rainforest, a section of BC's coast, National Geographic recently dubbed the wildest place in North America. It's home to a diverse animal population, including the rare white Kermode, nicknamed the Spirit Bear. Reporter Linda Aylesworth and cameraman Mike Timbrell traveled into the remote region for an in depth look at its people, the creatures that live there, and the issues that some say threaten to destroy the Great Bear Rainforest. It is the largest intact temperate rainforest on Earth, home of some of the planet's most unique and magnificent creatures. It is the Great Bear Rainforest, 64,000 square kilometers of spectacular rugged wilderness that spans BC's north and central coast. I just can't imagine anything more beautiful. You know, we are so lucky as Canadians to have a place like this. Ian McAllister has lived here with his family for 19 years. He's written numerous books about the Great Bear Rainforest, a name he and his father coined years ago. It seemed to suit the region so much better than what the government had been calling it, the Mid-Coast Timber Supply Area. The combination of the rich marine environment that supports so many species, right up against uh, this magnificent ancient temperate rainforest is, is really what um, uh, makes this place special. Aside from fishermen and First Nations who have lived here for generations, only a few hundred ecotourists are fortunate enough to experience this place firsthand every year. We're going to walk along and we'll see lots of salmon in the creek. Should be a pretty nice walk and hopefully we'll encounter some bears. Blue Water Adventures is one of five ecotourism companies that brings outsiders in. It's at this time of year, when the salmon are returning from their long journey at sea, that the chance of seeing bears is best. It's a chance that bears will come out to fish. But just because none graces with their presence today, doesn't mean they aren't around. So it's sort of like a, a signpost for the animals that they indicate that they're here. Is this claw marks too? Yeah, these are claw marks. And we've seen wolf tracks, we've seen bear tracks, seeing the salmon fight their way up the stream and the eagles watching us. Excellent first day. The best way, the only way really, to see the Great Bear Rainforest is by boat. For the next week, the crew of the Island Roamer will show its 11 guests from BC, the United States and Australia, sites most people will never see. Beneath the water, a humpback whale releases bubbles in a circle, corralling its tiny prey within. Then, mouth wide open, it rises to the surface to ingest its meal. That's amazing. So exciting, like I can hardly contain myself. Like I'd like to jump in. Oh, wow. It's just the most magical experience to be next to such a huge, huge animal. Once hunted in these very waters until there were none left to kill, humpback whales are at last recovering and returning. Hang on here to swirl in a sec. But it's time to continue our quest for bears. After all, they don't call this the great bear rainforest for nothing. We have here some of the highest concentrations of bears in North America. On a lush estuary, we have high hopes of seeing a grizzly bear. Keep on going. We gotta head over in the forest. We know they're here somewhere. You actually see repetitive patterns, but bears always step into the same step of the, of the bear previously. And sure enough, there they are. That's a female of a yelling cub. Remarkably, they're playing, even though they know we're nearby. It's an amazing experience. I think that it was an incredible privilege that we were able to come into a place like that and watch the sow and her cub go about their regular business. But what I want to emphasize is that we never approached the bear. It was, we saw the bear from quite a distance and just stood quietly and the bear came up as close as the bear felt comfortable. I'm thrilled because, uh, you know, I've come all the way from Australia. We certainly don't have grizzly bears, so it was a huge experience for me. There's only one thing that could top that encounter, something we all yearn to see, a rare white Kermode or spirit bear. Let's go and enjoy ourselves up there. Deep in the woods along a small salmon stream, we hunker down and watch a steady parade of black bears and their cubs. For us to watch as much as we have seen and different interactions, sows with cubs interaction, and that's quite, quite incredible. But then, in the distance, a flash of white. It's the moment we've been waiting for. It's an absolutely beautiful, stunning animal. And it's, uh, 
I think we're just mesmerized by one thing by the unusual and then by its beauty. It's a large male. He's not an albino, but a black bear with a rare recessive gene. He'll come and go several times throughout the course of the day, each visit indelibly etched into our memories, a rare privilege few people have experienced. But just one of the many reasons the Great Bear Rainforest is unique in the world, a treasure worth protecting. People leave with an, an understanding of, of wilderness and wild things, and I hope that sticks with them and that they take that away with them. We return to the Great Bear Rainforest tonight, turning our focus to the Kermode, or spirit bear. The white bear's unique appearance has for generations been explained through a First Nations creation story. But science tells us it's a genetic anomaly so rare that a trip to its home along B.C.'s central and northern coast doesn't guarantee a sighting. But reporter Linda Aylesworth and cameraman Mike Timbrell show us why it is worth the trip anyway. There was a time, according to First Nations legend, when the earth was covered with ice and snow. And man had a hard time surviving. So God told him, said, I'm going to make things easier for you. Things are going to start to grow trees and plants, berries and stuff are going to go for you to eat. I want you to look after it. The legend goes that uh, the raven, the creator, left one in ten bears white to remind us. The white bears to remind you the way the world used to be. Today, modern day science has a different explanation as to the origins of the spirit bear, which is in fact a type of black bear. This coastal black bear is a, is a unique, uh, uh, genetically unique population of bears that actually separated about 350,000 years ago um, from the black bears uh, on the rest of the continent. These bears, known as Kermodes, carry a recessive gene for white fur, which means that white bears aren't the only ones that can produce white cubs. When two black Kermodes get together, they have a 25% chance of producing a white cub, and when a black and white Kermode reproduce, the chances go up to 50%. The recessive gene can survive here in the Great Bear Rainforest because of the isolation that these remote islands afford. You don't have a lot of genes coming in from the outside. So if a new gene develops or a strain and it has no negative effect, it may multiply in this population. And that's what we apparently see in the Komodi bear. It's also resulted in the evolution of a unique subspecies of gray wolf, only found here along BC central and north coast. We have uh, fish-eating wolves which is a small type of wolf, and even I didn't know that, and I've been here over 70 years. I didn't know that the little monkeys were after salmon until I saw it myself. Now we really should be calling this place the Galapagos of the North. We're seeing these, the, these island uh, systems uh, providing this, the perfect environment for it to allow for these uh, unique genetic traits. Recently, the spirit bear graced the cover of National Geographic magazine. Its fame has certainly grown since the days when it was rarely spoken of by First Nations. Marvin Robinson was 19 years old when he first heard of it. Prior to that, we couldn't even talk about the spirit bear at the, our dinner table, and the elders would tell us to keep quiet. Why? It just how sacred it was, you know. You know, we didn't want want too much, uh, too many people to know about it. My husband at the time, as hereditary chief, said we need help to protect the bear. Protect from what? From from hunters. But now that the word is out, efforts are being made to educate the public, to protect the spirit bear and their environment through awareness. Simon Jackson was just 13 years old when he took on the cause. The big issue back then was habitat loss, and we've come a long way on that file. Um, many air, a huge chunk of the spirit bear's habitat is protected, but we still have a few more steps to go. We need to make sure it's a true sanctuary from trophy hunting and that we give this bear its best chance for survival long term. While it's illegal to kill a spirit bear, hunters can shoot the black Kermode bears that carry the recessive gene. It's just one of several controversial issues at conservation groups, like Jackson's Spirit Bear Youth Coalition, the largest youth-led environmental organization in the world, are taking on. It's a global treasure, and it plays a critical role within a globally important ecosystem, and that should make it matter to 
the average British Columbian, or to anywhere living in any part of the world. The threats that this place faces uh, will certainly impact uh, the future of the spirit bear. And I think the spirit bear has risen to the forefront in, in the campaign to protect this place. The Great Bear Rainforest has been described as the Galapagos of the North, a coastal sanctuary for rare and unusual species, including the Kermode, or spirit bear. Great portions of it are protected from logging and development, and for years, tankers have been forbidden from its waters. But that may be about to change with plans for a new pipeline out to the coast. That pipeline would bring oil and gas from Alberta to the port city of Kitimat. And a lot of people are worried about the risk of a spill along this pristine stretch of coastline, a place where one notable marine disaster has already happened. Here again, Linda Aylesworth and cameraman Mike Timbrell. The Great Bear Rainforest is a gorgeous, sometimes treacherous, maze of channels and fjords. A place where even those who have spent their lives navigating these waters sometimes go amiss. A place where even the biggest and most experienced can have things go terribly wrong. Well, what happened is, at their course alteration point here, in the middle of Wright Sound, they missed their alteration and they ran right into a rock Gill Rock off of the north end of Gill Island. It was March 2006 when the Queen of the North, a ferry that plied the waters between Prince Rupert and Port Hardy for 26 years, sank just after midnight. I was the first guy out there, me and another fellow. And uh, I said, I think we should get these kids and these old people into Hartley Bay. They're getting prepared for you guys. The nearby First Nations community of Hartley Bay came to the rescue, helping to save all but two of the ferry's 101 passengers. Opened the cultural center, put coffee on, bring some blankets, bring some clothing, some socks, some shoes. This would have been the last thing that the Queen of the North saw on their instrumentation as they grounded. So it's inconceivable to me that the ferry could have come straight down a long straight channel, Grenville Channel, and then run smack into Gill Island, which is straight ahead of us here. And yet, accidents happen, which is why there is concern, even anger, over the Enbridge Northern Gateway Project's proposal to use super tankers to ship Alberta oil sands crude from the port of Kitimat to Asia by way of the Great Bear Rainforest. So this would facilitate over a half a million barrels of, of crude oil, unrefined uh, bitumen tar sands oil, uh, in more than one oil tanker per day, traveling through this treacherous, uh, you know, reef encased, narrow fjords and inlets. Should one of those super tankers go aground, the consequences would be disastrous to the creatures and the people who live here. We are dead against them. Why? Because. Uh, they're threatening our source of food out here on the ocean. The people of Hartley Bay and other remote communities along the coast depend on the ocean for their livelihood. Whatever affects us by those tankers will affect this whole northern coast right down to the central area. And our peoples know that. They know that just from that little queen that sank out here. But Enbridge and their safety consultants insist that there is no danger. I feel for them, but I am very, very confident that with the things that are being put in place for this particular operation, that um, we can do it very, very safely. Things like double hulls that became mandatory after the Exxon Valdez catastrophe in Prince William Sound over 20 years ago. Specially trained pilots to help navigate and tugboats ready to act in the event of a problem. We're talking about a highly trained tugboat escort crew that knows exactly what maneuver they will have to do on a route, plus the pilot who has worked in conjunction with them. I don't care what guarantees you will give me about the tanker. I don't care if it's double hulled or, or all uh, that it's going to have guides coming in. You know, I always say they said that about the Titanic and what happened to her. But oil spills aren't the only worry. The, the cumulative impact that these oil tankers will have on acoustically sensitive mammals like, uh, like whales, um, even, even if a spill doesn't happen, just introducing oil tankers to this coast will have huge, huge negative impact on, on this ecosystem. I want my great-grandchildren and great-great and those unborn 
to have the same experience and living that I have, that it's all out there for them and not some big tanker going by because the world has a glut for oil. Our series on BC's Great Bear Rainforest wraps up with a look at how this precious ecosystem is holding up against encroaching development. The world's largest temperate rainforest is home to the rare white Kermode, or spirit bear. Last night we showed how a proposed pipeline could impact this vast wilderness and the creatures that call it home. Tonight, what others see as an equal threat. Reporter Linda Aylesworth and cameraman Mike Timbrell explore the impact of fish farming and hunting on the spirit bear along BC's wild north and central coast. Salmon are the life's blood of the BC coast. They nourish the creatures, the land and the people of the Great Bear Rainforest. But there's trouble in paradise. We're really seeing a collapse of wild salmon. Uh, whereas the fishermen here used to fish salmon from April all the way to October. Now they're just fishing for a few weeks in the, in the late summer. And what scares me now is we're running low on humps. There's hardly any pinks this year in the river. Hardly any. What, what's causing it? We don't know. Some say that salmon farms are the cause, or at least part of it. Farms owned by Marine Harvest, the world's largest producer of farmed salmon, and operated on water leased from the Kittisu Nation, who process the fish in their remote community of Clem 2. After 25 years, we've got 1.2 to 1.4 million a year in wages into the community. Um, usually it's between 55 and 60 jobs. Salmon farming has done great things for the Kittisu, and they say they reinvest tens of thousands of dollars each year into research. But can they say their open net farms are not harming wild salmon? People ask me this question all the time, and, and I say, well, we don't know yet whether it's fully sustainable, but when we look at the data that we've seen from wild salmon, which is one of the main concerns that we have, um, so far from our studies, and again, some of them are published studies, they're not showing that there are large impacts. Critics would like to see these open net pens replaced by closed containers on land, a system that would prevent disease and parasites from spreading to migrating wild salmon. And the wild stocks are the largest natural protein source in this part of the world. And until we're sure as to whether or not these will or will not affect them, we shouldn't be farming in open net pens. Bears are among the many creatures that suffer when wild salmon returns are low. But right now they face a more immediate danger. It's trophy hunting season, and only the white Kermode, or spirit bear, is protected by law. Trophy hunters are now coming, they're flying in, they're coming in by boat, and they're coming here to take a trophy home. And uh, this season, black bears will be killed that carry the recessive gene that uh, produces a pure white bear. The BC Wildlife Federation says their members, the ones who trophy hunt, as opposed to the ones who hunt for food, are doing the spirit bear a favor. Some of the arguments say that by harvesting the black bear, uh, we're actually increasing the percentage of white bears in the area and maybe actually enhancing their, uh, their opportunity or their probability of increasing. Many do not agree. Science has indicated that um, the Kermode bear gene pool is so fragile that any huge fluctuation, high or low, uh, could lead to the dilution and, and gradual extinction of the white bear. And obviously she knows we're here. But... As for the grizzly bears, a license to kill costs local trophy hunters $80. Out-of-province hunters, just over a thousand for their prize. Then there's the money paid to outfitters. Still, it's a pittance compared to the money ecotourism brings into BC. They can't hunt a mom with a cub. But if the mom was by herself, she could be shot. Those two bears probably earned our economy $15,000 today. The most that they'd be making out of a hunt here would be $500. Hunting is a, a very useful tool in the wildlife management process. Without hunting, uh, we would lose a lot of our conservation work that the, the hunters and the clubs do around the province. And we are really the ones that do the conservation work, on the ground work and the field work, rather than the, the anti-hunting or the protest groups. But does the Great Bear Rainforest need that kind of management? Does anyone really know how many bears there are and how many this ecosystem can afford to lose? I think the big problem with any hunting is like, is that actually ethical? And are any of the numbers they use 
in any shape or form accurate. I mean, a lot of it is total guesswork. Why take the risk when there's very little economic benefit to doing so? I think we can create a stronger economy, a stronger social fabric in our society, and most importantly, do right by this bear in the last place it can call home if we strike a realistic balance. You know, it's not an anti-hunting position, it's a pro-bear position in, in, in really what is their last chance.